Chapter Seventeen of Famous Men of Modern Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Famous Men of Modern Times by John H. Herron and A. B. Poland. Chapter Seventeen, Louis the Fourteenth, sixteen thirty-eight to seventeen fifteen. After the death of Richelieu in sixteen forty-two. Louis the Thirteenth, King of France, followed the advice of his great prime minister and called Cardinal Mazarin to fill his place. But Louis the Thirteenth lived only six months after Richelieu passed away. He died in sixteen forty three, and his son Louis the Fourteenth succeeded him as king. Louis the Fourteenth had the longest and most brilliant reign in the history of France, and the French people have always called him the Grand Monarch. He was born in sixteen thirty eight and became king when he was but five years old. His mother governed the kingdom as regent until he was thirteen, but Mazarin was retained in office and quickly became the real ruler of France. Mazarin was a great statesman, but he was determined to have his own way. Many of the things he did cost a great deal of money, and so he made the people of France pay very heavy taxes, and this caused them to dislike him exceedingly. Finally, they became so discontented that they began a revolt known as the War of the Fronde, which means the War of the Sling. The name was given to ridicule the revolting party, who were chiefly peasants and who were too poor to buy proper arms. They were compared to the disorderly boys of Paris, who sometimes fought with slings, and the name arose in that way. This war lasted four years, and at its close, Mazarin was dismissed. But he was soon put into office again and had even more power than before. As a boy, Louis the Fourteenth was more fond of military exercises than of study. He took great delight in handling swords and beating drums. The boys belonging to some of the noble families of France were the playmates of the young king, and he formed them into a company of soldiers and spent some time every day in drilling them. In 1651, when he reached the age of thirteen. He took the government into his own hands, but Mazarin remained prime minister. One of the first things Louis did, after declaring himself king, was to go with General Turin into the south of France upon a military expedition. He was greatly pleased with life in the army and came back to Paris enthusiastic about military tactics. General Turin said, "The young king, when I make war, you must lead my troops." I deeply thank you, sire, for your good opinion of me," replied the famous general. "I should be glad, indeed, to have command of your Majesty's army in any war in which you may be engaged. Well, general," said Louis, "I feel sure that I shall have lots of wars, and you must be ready to help me." Years afterwards, Louis's words came true. He carried on many wars, and in some of them, Turenne won fame as one of the greatest commanders of his time. Louis saw that Mazarin was managing the affairs of the nation with great skill, so he allowed himself to do as he thought best, while His Majesty devoted himself to a life of pleasure. But in 1661, when Louis was twenty-three, Mazarin died. The day after Mazarin's death, the officers of the government assembled at the palace, all eager to know which of them was to be the new prime minister. "To whom shall we speak in the future about the business of the kingdom?" asked one of them. To me," answered the king. "Hereafter, I shall be my own prime minister." After thus taking matters into his own hands, he reigned for more than fifty years. He placed in control of the different departments of his government the best men he could find, and one of his officers, the famous Colbert, managed the money matters in the kingdom in such a manner as to make his name illustrious for all time. He made the taxes less burdensome to the people, and at the same time he so fostered the industries of the kingdom that the revenue was greatly increased. Louis improved the condition of the French people. He encouraged manufacturers. He even established some factories at the expense of the government, so that during his reign France became famous for her woolens and carpets, her silks and tapestries. Louis also founded schools and colleges. He improved the country roads. He began the great canal which connects the Mediterranean with the Bay of Biscay. He did all in his power to advance the welfare of the kingdom. At Versailles, a few miles from Paris, he built the largest and most magnificent palace in France. He adorned it with lovely paintings and statues, and surrounded it with lovely gardens. There he lived in great splendor and gathered about him a large company of talented men and beautiful women. 
the Louvre, the Trianon, the Tuileries, and some other of the most beautiful buildings for which Paris is still noted, were also built during his reign. In 1685 Louis revoked the famous Edict of Nantes, under which Henry of Navarre had granted religious liberty to the French people. In consequence over three hundred thousand Protestants left France. They carried with them their tools and their trades, and moved into other countries. More than forty thousand of them settled in England, where they were received with open arms. In his later life Louis had the same fondness for war as in his youth, and during nearly fifteen years he was engaged in wars with various European nations. His army was large and thoroughly disciplined. He had also a navy which made France powerful on the ocean. He used to say with great pride, I can fight the world equally well on the sea or on the land. Wars were fought with Spain, Holland, England, Germany, and other nations, and brilliant victories were won. These successes delighted the French people, and they almost adored their grand monarch. Louis the Fourteenth became almost as much the terror of Europe as Napoleon about a hundred years later, and then the decline began. Among the men who helped to break down the military glory of Louis the Fourteenth was Prince Eugene of Savoy. Prince Eugene was born in Paris in 1663. As soon as he was old enough for military service, he asked King Louis to make him an officer in the French army. Louis was not friendly to Eugene's mother, and the request of the young prince was refused. Indignant at this, Eugene left France, but he was determined to be a soldier somewhere. He was twenty-two years old when the Turks laid siege to Vienna, and he was among the soldiers who helped to drive them back. His bravery brought him into notice, and he rapidly rose from rank to rank. At twenty-one he was a colonel, at twenty-two a major-general, and at twenty-four a lieutenant-general. After serving in numerous battles against the Turks, Prince Eugene was sent, in command of an Austrian force, into northern Italy, where Louis the Fourteenth was threatening the province of Savoy. Eugene now had one of the great satisfactions of his life. When Louis had refused him a commission in the French army, he had said that he would never again enter France except as a conqueror. After several victories in Italy, he marched into France, captured several towns, and returned to Italy laden with great plunder, thus making good his word. But the most important thing achieved by Eugene and his allies during this war with Louis was the capture of a strongly fortified town called Castle. This town stood near the borders of France and Italy, and commanded the easiest and most frequently travelled pass between the two countries. When the town was taken, Eugene made it one of the conditions of surrender that its fortifications should be destroyed and never rebuilt. Yet this did not prevent Louis the Fourteenth from making other attempts to capture northern Italy, and Prince Eugene afterwards served in two other long wars that were successfully fought in its defence. Louis continued fighting against Italy, Bavaria, and the Netherlands, and kept all Europe in a state of turmoil. Then came the great battle of Blenheim, in 1704. Louis had made himself so obnoxious, and had become so dreaded, that a great league of European nations was formed against him. In the battle of Blenheim the English, under the Duke of Marlborough, united their forces with those of the Austrians, under Prince Eugene. The defeat of Louis the Fourteenth on this occasion was one of the most disastrous ever suffered by the French, and it greatly encouraged those who were defending the liberties of Europe. Louis's power in Bavaria and Holland was shattered, and his armies were never again so much of a terror as they had been. Louis did not, however, give up at once. Fighting continued for about ten years longer, but there were no further victories for France. When the war was ended, in 1713, by the Peace of Utrecht, the French were obliged to give up to the British, Acadia, the Hudson's Bay Territory, and Newfoundland, Austria also was given possession of some of the territory which had been held by France. A year later, in 1714, by the Treaty of Rostadt, it was agreed that all the different nations which had been engaged in the war should have just what belonged to them before the war began. The glory of France and her grand monarch had departed. He lived only a little more than two years after peace was proclaimed. He died on September 1st, 1715, at the age of 77, having reigned 72 years. End of chapter 17。18. Of Famous Men of Modern Times This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Jevons Famous Men of Modern Times by John H. Haran and A. B. Poland Chapter 18 Sir Isaac Newton 1642-1727 to In 1642, the very year in which the great civil war broke out between Charles I of England and his Parliament, a wonderful man was born, named Isaac Newton. As an infant he was so feeble that none of his family expected that he would live. If he had been a Spartan baby, he would, according to Spartan law, certainly have been put to death. But by extra care on his mother's part his life was saved, and he grew into a lad with more than the ordinary powers of strength and endurance. He was born in Woolsthorpe in Lincolnshire, just one year after the death of Galileo, to whom he may be said to have borne a strong mental likeness. When he first entered school he did not seem to be a very bright lad, but this was because he was not really trying to do his best. One day a boy who ranked above him in his class struck him a severe blow. This proved to be one of the best things that ever happened to young Newton, for, feeling that he was no match for the other lad with his fists, he determined to get even with him by beating him in the work of the class. This he soon did, and then he rose higher and higher until he stood above all the other boys in the school. He spent most of his play hours in making mechanical toys. He watched some workmen who were putting up a windmill near his school, and then made a working model of it and fixed it on the roof of the house in which he lived. He constructed a clock, which was worked by a stream of water falling upon a small water-wheel. He also built a carriage and fitted it with levers, so that he could sit in it and move himself from place to place. This was, perhaps, the first velocipede ever constructed. In Newton's day gas-lamps and electric lights were unknown. The winter days were short, and it often happened that he had to go to school in the dark. So he made for himself a paper lantern to give him light on his early journeys, and this was soon copied by the other boys. In the yard of the house in which his parents lived, he traced on a wall, by means of fixed pins, the movements of the sun. Clocks were then very expensive, and the contrivance, which received the name of Isaac's Dial, was a standard of the time to the country people of the neighbourhood. When he was fourteen, his stepfather died, and his mother thought it best for Isaac to work upon a farm which belonged to the family. So he left school but he had no love for ploughing and reaping, or for attending to horses, cows and pigs. The sheep went astray while he was thinking out some problem in algebra or geometry, and the cattle got into the standing crops and munched the milky wheat ears while he was studying the motions of the moon, or wondering what made the earth go round the sun. His mother soon saw that Isaac would never make a farmer. He was therefore sent back to school, and fitted to enter college. He was the most wonderful mathematician that ever graduated from the University of Cambridge, and when only twenty-seven he was made Professor of Mathematics in the college in which he had studied. He rose to eminence in the University, and through the influence of some of its leaders he was appointed Warden of the Mint in 1695, and was promoted to the Mastership four years later. He then moved to London, and went to live in a little house near Leicester Square, his salary enabled him to devote himself to his favourite studies, and this he proceeded to do. One of the first important discoveries he made was about light. Before his time, every one thought that light was made up of fine lines or rays, bright but without any colour. Isaac made an experiment which any boy can repeat. He bored a small hole through the shutter of a window, so as to only allow a delicate pencil of light to enter the room. This made a round spot of white or colourless light on the wall opposite the window, and he set out to examine this spot and see what it could teach him. When he put a glass prism into the pathway of the ray, he found that the colourless spot disappeared. Instead of it, he saw on the wall, above where the circular spot had been, a beautiful band of light in which several colours were blended. At the top end this band was blue, at the bottom it was red, in the middle it was yellow. Newton had thus discovered that a ray of white light is made up of coloured rays. 
His next experiment was with soap bubbles. He found that when blown very thin, the colours of the light could be more plainly discerned, and he was soon able to count seven distinct tints, violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. These are the seven colours seen in the rainbow. But the greatest of Newton's discoveries was that which is now spoken of as the law of gravitation. Everybody knew, long before Newton was born, that apples fell from trees to the ground, but no one seems to have asked the question why they never moved the other way. All boys know that a ball thrown up into the air will come down again, but no one before Newton lived had tried to find out why this was so. At first he seems to have thought that only things that were near to the earth would fall to its surface, but when he thought how the raindrops fell from the clouds, he saw that his theory was not true. Then he thought of the moon going round the earth, and wondered how it kept just so high up in the sky, and why it did not fall like the raindrops. This was a new puzzle, and he set to work to solve it. About two hundred years before Isaac Newton was born, a great Polish astronomer named Copernicus had written a book in which he had said that people were wrong who believed that the sun goes round the earth. Copernicus insisted that the earth moves round the sun. At the first people made fun of this idea, but by Newton's day they had begun to believe it. Isaac began to wonder if this theory might not help him to solve his problem. One of the favourite games of the boys of that day was to throw stones with a sling. Doubtless Isaac had himself used one many times in his play. Now that he was grown up, he remembered how he had whirled the stones round and round at a high rate of speed, and yet they never left the sling until he let go one of the strings. Isaac knew that the moon goes whirling round the earth at the rate of 50,000 miles every day, and that the earth whirls round the sun at the rate of about 1,000 miles a minute. Certainly, thought Newton, the moon goes round the earth, and the earth goes round the sun, just as a stone is whirled round in a sling, but there must be something stronger than a cord to keep them in their places. After thinking about the matter for a long time, he said, the moon is drawn towards the earth by a very powerful force, but she does not come nearer to the earth or fall upon it, any more than the stone in the sling falls upon the hand of the slinger, because, like the stone, she is in rapid motion. The earth is drawn towards the sun by the same wonderful force that draws the moon towards the earth, yet the earth does not fall upon the sun, because it is all the while whirling forward at the rate of a thousand miles a minute. Newton saw that the force which brings the stone and the apple down to the ground is the very same that draws the moon towards the earth and the earth towards the sun. He called this force gravity, or force of weight. Then his great mind went on thinking beyond the moon and the earth to the far away stars. He soon learned that the same force which keeps the moon and the earth in their orbit keeps all the stars of the sky in their courses. For his great discoveries he was highly honoured by the learned men of his day, he was made a member of the Royal Society, a society established for the purpose of gathering up and treasuring all forms of valuable knowledge. The Royal Society aided him in publishing his books, of which he wrote twelve. The most important of these is called the Principia. In 1705 he was knighted by Queen Anne, and when he died in 1727 his body lay in state for a whole week in the Jerusalem chamber, and was then buried with great pomp in Westminster Abbey. End of chapter 18「19 of Famous Men of Modern Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman. Famous Men of Modern Times by John H. Harron and A. B. Poland. Chapter 19. William the Third, King of England, 1650 to 1702. The story of King William's life is an interesting one. He was born in Holland in 1650, and was a prince of the distinguished House of Orange, 
which for many years had been prominent in the history of the Netherlands. William was carefully educated. He showed so much ability that when he was only twenty-two years old he was chosen Stadtholder, or President of the Netherlands. In 1672, Louis the Fourteenth, with an army of 125,000 men, under the command of Turenne and Condé, invaded the Netherlands. England united her forces with France and lent her fleet to crush the power of the Dutch. Town after town was taken by the French, and the Dutch were in a terrible plight. Young as he was, William carried on the war like an experienced general. His army had reverses at first, but his belief in the final triumph of the Dutch never left him. Once a despondent official said to him, "'Do you not see that the country is lost?' "'Lost,' replied William. "'No, it is not lost. I shall never see it lost.' In this spirit of confidence he fought his enemies, never despairing, never acknowledging defeat. After many successes the French were about to seize the city of Amsterdam. William ordered the dikes to be cut, and the waters of the North Sea spread over the lowlands. The growing crops were ruined, but the flood checked the invading army. When, in 1674, peace was made with England, New York, which was originally a Dutch settlement and was called New Amsterdam, was ceded to Great Britain. It was renamed New York in honor of James, Duke of York, to whom his brother Charles II had, in 1664, granted all the land between the Connecticut and the Delaware. France inflicted great disasters upon the Netherlands, and actually secured part of her territory, but Louis was at length forced to withdraw from the country. The Dutch, under the heroic leadership of their young stadtholder, maintained their independence. On the death of King Charles II in 1685, the Duke of York came to the English throne under the title of James II. He, however, aroused very great dissatisfaction in England by some of his acts, and in June 1688, a letter was sent to William of Orange, inviting him and his wife Mary who was a daughter of James the Second, to become sovereigns of England. This letter was signed by seven leading men of both the great political parties in England. It assured William that it was the universal wish of the English nation that he should become its ruler. The invitation was accepted. The Netherlands, glad to have their honored stadtholder on the English throne, furnished him with an army of about 13,000 men and a fleet of more than six hundred ships, and with these forces he reached England in November 1688. William landed his army and marched to Exeter, where the citizens welcomed him in a very enthusiastic manner. Thousands of the nobles, gentry, and common people flocked to his standard. His army rapidly increased. Everywhere in England there was great rejoicing at his arrival. King James gathered a strong force, mostly from Scotland and Ireland, and marched to Salisbury to check the revolt. But William met him bravely, and the king's army fell back in disorder, and many of the officers and men deserted. James gave up the struggle in despair, and hastened to London. There he learned that his daughter Anne had left his palace to join the revolters. "'God help me!' cried the king, "'for my own children have forsaken me.' His spirit was utterly broken, and he prepared for a rapid journey to France. He knew that the throne was lost to him, and he resolved to flee from England and cast himself upon the hospitality of his cousin, the French king, Louis the Fourteenth. Leaving the palace that night, and in disguise, he threw the seals of state into the Thames, and then took a boat to a ship which was lying some distance down the river. James hoped to sail in this ship to France, but his escape was prevented by a fisherman who thought him a suspicious character, and he was brought back to London. William and Mary, with the army that supported them, came to London. There was a wonderful demonstration of joy by the people of the metropolis, and the Queen was greeted with acclamation. A committee of Parliament drew up a Declaration of Rights, which was presented to William and Mary. It was declared what the rights of Englishmen are, 
stated that no sovereign could interfere with those rights, and expressed the resolve of both Houses of Parliament to maintain them. It seemed like a second Magna Carta. William and Mary both signed it, and they were then, in February 1689, declared King and Queen of England. This change in the rulers, the abdication of King James and the coming of William and Mary, is called the Revolution of 1688. As has been said, it was easily accomplished in England, but in Ireland there was decided opposition to it. Londonderry and Enniskillen were the only Irish towns that declared for William and Mary. The other towns were strongly in favor of James. Finally, James came from France to Ireland, collected an army, and began a war on those who supported the new sovereigns. He received assistance from Louis the Fourteenth of France. Those who fought for James were called Jacobites, and the others were called Orangemen. The war in Ireland lasted but a few months, for at the Battle of the Boyne, on July 12, 1690, James's army was defeated, and all resistance in Ireland came to an end. William was then formally recognized as King of Great Britain and Ireland. England had declared war on France, and it became necessary for William to visit the European continent. He there made alliances with Austria, Spain, and other nations. While he was absent from England, Mary ruled the kingdom, and ruled it well. William was engaged for some years in the contest on the continent. He won many great battles, but he also suffered disastrous defeats. While he was in Europe, another attempt was made by James to invade England and regain the throne. Louis the Fourteenth again provided James with soldiers and warships, and an expedition sailed for England. James was confident of success, and all associated with him thought it would be an easy matter to accomplish the undertaking. Near the coast of Normandy, the invading fleet came upon the combined English and Dutch fleet, and off the Cape of La Hogue, a furious battle took place. The English and Dutch gained a brilliant victory, and James sailed back to France, and never again made a movement to recover the English throne. While England and France were fighting in Europe, the colonies of the two countries were fighting in America. The war is known in American history as King William's War. The reign of William and Mary is of great interest to us in the United States. Those sovereigns were not accepted by the people of England until they had signed the Declaration of Rights, and the very first act passed by Parliament during their reign was one which made the Declaration a part of the laws of the land. That declaration secured their rights not only to the subjects who lived in the mother country, but also to those in the colonies. One of its provisions was that it is the right of the subjects to petition the king. George III spurned the petitions of the colonists, and otherwise violated the rights claimed in the declaration, just as James II had done. What the American colonists did, therefore, when they fought the battles of the Revolution, was very similar to what the people of England had done a hundred years before, when they dethroned James and offered the crown to William and Mary. The English Revolution of 1688 and the American Revolution had exactly the same purpose. End of chapter 19 Recording by Rhonda Fetterman To any of famous men of modern times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M. C. Y. Famous Men of Modern Times by John H. Herring and A. B. Poland. Chapter 20. Zobieski. Zobieski, 1624 to 1696. The Poles first appeared in history in the 5th century under the name of Poliani. There appears to have been a definitely organized kingdom of Poland as early as the 10th century, but the country did not rise into much prominence until the 14th century, and it attained its greatest splendor in the 17th. 
The name Poland is derived from a word meaning plains. For many centuries great herds of cattle, horses, and swine have been raised within its territory, and cereals, hemp, timber, honey, and wax have been produced in large quantities. Numerous mines of salt, and a few of iron, copper, and silver have been worked at different periods, but they are not of much value. After passing through a vast number of changes, Poland became in 1572 an elective monarchy, and this principle became one of the chief causes of the national downfall. The nation consisted of but two classes, the nobles who owned the soil, and the serfs who cultivated it. There was no third state. At the time of which we write, the Turks were at the height of their power in southeastern Europe. Their flag still waved, as it had done for a hundred and fifty years over Belgrade, and Belgrade was the gateway to Hungary. Their fleets swept the Mediterranean, they captured the island of Crete from the powerful state of Venice, and they fortified the Dardanelles, so that no ships could enter the Black Sea without their permission. Poland being famous for its wheat and cattle, the Turks greatly desired to possess it. They therefore invaded Poland with a large army, but the Poles met them bravely, and in a great battle in which Zobieski served as commander-in-chief of the Polish forces, succeeded in beating them back. Just at that time, the king of Poland died quite suddenly, and the diet assembled to select a successor. Zobieski entered the hall where the diet was in session, and proposed the name of a French prince. Then one of the nobles was heard to say, Let a Pole rule Poland. Zobieski was at once proposed, and elected with hardly a dissentient voice. John Zobieski was born in 1624, at Olesko, in Galicia. His father was castellan, or keeper of the castle of Krakow. John received an excellent education, both at home and in foreign countries, and this was a great advantage to him when he was elevated to the throne. Poland was, at the time, one of the most powerful countries of Europe. It was stronger by far than Russia, and gave promise of a still greater future. A hundred years before this the Turks had threatened Vienna, and they now determined to conquer all Austria. In 1683 they gathered a vast army and marched a second time against Vienna, which was at the time not only the principal city of Austria, but the capital of the German Empire. The emperor then ruling over Germany was Leopold I. He wore the crown of Charlemagne, but he was not worthy to do so. As soon as he heard that the Turks were marching toward Vienna, he fled from the city, and many of the nobles and wealthy people followed his example. Count Stahenberg, who was in command of the garrison, stayed at his post, and did everything possible to prevent the city from falling into the hands of the enemy. The fortifications needed repair. Not only the men, but the women aided in the work. The women mixed mortar, and even carried stone, while the men built up the walls. One day, as the people of Vienna were looking eastward, they saw columns of smoke ascending. Crops were burning, and houses and villages were in flames. This told them only too plainly that the Turks were approaching, and at sunrise on the 14th of July, 1683, they appeared before the city walls. Their camp made a semicircle or crescent reaching more than half around the city. As in Athens, during the terrible siege by the Spartans in the Peloponnesian War, so now in Vienna the plague broke out. This was because the people who had rushed into the city from the country were huddled so closely together. The amount of sickness was terrible. Then a fire broke out, and as there were no fire engines nor other appliances with which to fight the flames, a great many houses were burned, and hundreds of families were rendered homeless. Things looked very discouraging, but just when they were at the worst, help came. John Zobieski, King of Poland, was marching to the relief of the beleaguered city. He had 65,000 men in his army, and John George, the Elector of Saxony, had joined him with 13,000 more. Before beginning the attack of the Turks, Zobieski made a speech to his men in which he said, Not Vienna alone. But Christendom looks to you today. Not for an earthly sovereign do you fight. 
you are soldiers of the king of kings the battle cry was obieski's own name it was well known to the turks for they had met him before and thousands of turks fled before hundreds of his poles his very name seemed to fill them with dread large numbers of the turkish soldiers stood their ground however and fought desperately but they could not withstand the furious charge of the poles zobieski himself went into the battle singing the words of the psalm beginning not unto us o lord not unto us but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake six of the sultan's pashas or generals were killed and the grand vizier or prime minister of turkey abandoned his splendid green silk tent that was embroidered with gold and silver and fled for his life the whole muslim army was routed and the conqueror and his troops entered the city in triumph a great service of thanksgiving was held in the cathedral and one of the priests preached a sermon from the text there was a man sent from god whose name was john never again did the turks attack vienna city after city was lost to their empire and all hungary was finally won back from them since dobieski's great victory the power of the turks has steadily waned rather than increased they have been slowly pushed to the eastward until there is now little of value left to them in europe but constantinople the reign of john zobieski was the most brilliant in polish history but the constant dissensions and the unending turbulence of the polish nobles frustrated all his efforts to strengthen the kingdom and prepare the way for its final dismemberment and ruin the hero of poland has not like hercules or Perseus, given his name to a great constellation but in the brightest part of the milky way hangs a gleaming expanse of stardust known as zobieski's shield so that until the stars forget to shine or the man to watch them the name of the great polish hero will never be forgotten end of chapter twenty famous men of modern times this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by rhonda fetterman famous men of modern times by john h harron and a b poland chapter 21 peter the great 1672 to 1725 in the history of Russia there is no name more famous than that of Peter the Great. Before his time the Russians were far behind the other nations of Europe in knowledge of the arts and the comforts of life. Peter devoted a large part of his reign to improving the condition of his country and his people. He made Russia prosperous, powerful, and respected. He was born in 1672 and was the son of the Emperor Alexis. When only ten years old, he came to the throne, together with his brother Ivan, who was almost an idiot. The boys were proclaimed joint emperors of Russia, but their sister, Sophia, who was many years older than they, acted as regent. Sophia determined to make herself empress, and leagued herself with Galitzin, the prime minister, with that end in view. Madam, said Galitzin, we need fear nothing from Ivan but peter alarms me he has a thirst for knowledge that cannot be quenched he wishes to know everything it was as the minister said peter had a remarkable desire for knowledge and he learned many useful things when he was about seventeen years of age he was informed that his sister sophia and prince galitzin intended to murder him peter at once banished galitzin to the icy region of archangel and confined his sister in a convent. He thus became, at about eighteen years of age, the active ruler of Russia, for Ivan could take no share in the government. Peter listened to others before taking important action. He valued particularly the advice of a brilliant Swiss named Lefort, to whom he gave a high position in his court. Lefort urged that the army should be made larger, and be better drilled and equipped, the young emperor accepted this advice. He appointed Lefort to be commander of one division of his army, 
and directed him to equip and drill it in the very best manner. Peter himself served for a few months under the command of Lefort as a common soldier. He performed all his duties with the greatest faithfulness. He became a subordinate officer, and then rose gradually through every grade until he reached the rank of general. Under Lefort's direction, the army was made a splendid body of fighting men. One day, in the early part of his reign, Peter noticed on the river which flows through Moscow a small boat with a keel. He inquired what the keel was for, and was greatly interested to learn that it was to enable the boat to sail against the wind. The boat had been built for Peter's father by a Dutchman named Brandt, and this man was at once instructed to put it into first-rate order. This being done, the Dutchman gave Peter some lessons in sailing, so that the young Tsar became quite an expert sailor. Russia at that time had only one seaport. It was Archangel on the White Sea. So to Archangel the Tsar went, and made it his home for several months. While there he made the acquaintance of a Dutch captain named Much, and from him he learned all about ships and their management. He began as a cabin boy, and worked up through every department of seafaring life until he was fitted to be a naval commander. Peter felt that he must have a navy, and must be at its head, so he thought he ought to know about the building of ships as well as their management. He therefore determined to go to Holland, and learn the art of shipbuilding. Putting the affairs of his empire in charge of three nobles, he left Russia, with Lefort and some other companions, and went to Amsterdam, the most important city of the Netherlands. After visiting Amsterdam and examining its shipping and its docks, he went to a little town called Zandam nearby, and there he became a workman in a yard where ships were built for the famous Dutch East India Company. He lived in a little cottage near the yard and cooked his own food. After working some time in Zandam, he spent four or five months as a shipwright near London, because some things connected with shipbuilding could be better learned in England than in the Netherlands. When, by taking lessons in both countries, he had thoroughly mastered the art, he returned to his own country. He now began the building of the Russian navy at a place in southern Russia on the Verona River. The vessels built were small gunboats. While they were being built, someone said to Peter, Of what use will your vessels be to you? You have no good seaport. My vessels shall make ports for themselves, replied Peter. And before long, they did so. The first port captured was Azov, at the mouth of the Don. It was taken from the Turks. The Russian fleet sailed down the river and made the attack by sea, while twelve thousand troops attacked by land. Peter himself was sometimes with the army on land, sometimes on board one of his vessels. The capture of Azov gave Russia a port on the Black Sea, but this was only the beginning. A greater work was done in the north, at the mouth of the Neva. When Peter came to the throne, Sweden was the great military and naval power of northern Europe. The Swedes were masters of the Baltic Sea and of the Gulf of Finland. Peter said that the Swedes were the oppressors of Russia, and that he would free the land from their presence. When in the Netherlands, he had lived near Amsterdam. It was a great seaport near the mouth of a river. The land upon which it stood was swampy, and its dwellings, its warehouses, and its magnificent churches and public buildings rested on piles. The river Neva flowed into the Gulf of Finland. Peter determined to build a Russian Amsterdam on its swampy banks. The king of Sweden, the famous Charles the Twelfth, claimed the province at the mouth of the river Neva. In spite of this, Peter laid the foundations of his new city and called it St. Petersburg. When the king of Sweden heard what was going on, he said, I shall soon put those houses into a blaze. The Swedish fortresses guarded the province and the mouth of the river. Whoever held them would control the commerce of St. Petersburg. The Swedish king was astonished, soon after hearing that the foundations of St. Petersburg had been laid, to learn that Peter's new army and navy had captured his two fortresses.
and that the province at the mount of the Neva was in Peter's hands. Soon afterward, with a well-drilled army, Charles laid siege to Poltava, a small fortified town of the Russians. Peter marched against him. Both sovereigns commanded their armies in person. Charles had been wounded in his heel and had to be carried into battle on a litter. During the battle a cannonball killed one of the bearers and shattered the litter, whereupon the king is said to have ordered some of the men to carry him upon their pikes. Peter, like Charles, was in the hottest of the fire. His clothes were shot through in several places, one ball going through his hat. After desperate fighting on both sides, the Swedes gave way. They left more than half their number dead or wounded upon the field. Only a few hundred men escaped with the king, who, it is said, was taken off the field in a carriage drawn by twelve horses. The victory at Poltava was followed by naval successes in the Gulf of Finland. Abo, then the capital of Finland, and Helsingfors, which is the present capital, were both captured, and the Russians became masters of the Gulf. Peter was determined that his people should become a commercial nation. He urged them to engage in foreign trade and encouraged foreigners to bring their merchandise to Russia's new ports. Less than six months after the first stone of St. Petersburg was laid, a large ship under Dutch colors ascended the Neva and anchored off the city site. Peter himself went on board to welcome the strangers. The skipper was invited to dine at the house of one of the nobles. Peter and several officers of his government bought the entire cargo, and when the ship sailed from St. Petersburg, the captain received a present of about two hundred dollars, and each of his crew a smaller sum of money, as a premium for having brought the first foreign vessel into the new port. Peter encouraged his people in the different parts of Russia to carry on commerce with one another, and he made it easy for them to do so. He improved the roads, aided in providing boats for navigating the rivers, and undertook the gigantic work of uniting the great seas, the Baltic, the Black, and the Caspian Seas by canals. Toward the close of his reign, Peter visited the town of Zandam in Holland, where he had learned the trade of shipbuilding. There he found some of his old companions, and was delighted to hear them salute him as Peter Bass, the name by which they had known him nearly twenty years before. He went to the little cottage in which he had lived. It is still carefully preserved. In one room are to be seen the little oak table and three chairs which were there when Peter occupied it. Over the chimney-piece is an inscription which every boy who is making his way up in the world might well take for his motto. To a great man nothing is little. Peter went to see an old friend, kissed the blacksmith, who was at work in his smithy. The Tsar took the job from him. He blew the bellows, heated the piece of iron, and beat it out with a great hammer into the required shape. Though he was the ruler of millions of people, he was proud of being a workman and of being able to do things for himself. No sovereign ever more truly deserved the title great than did Peter. He found his empire feeble, and left it with a well-drilled army and a large navy. He found it without commerce. He secured for it ports to which foreign ships might bring merchandise, and he dug canals so that the different parts of the country might easily carry on trade with one another. Thus he was, in the best sense, great, because he made his country great, and provided for his people new and better ways of living. End of chapter 21. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman. Chapter 22 of Famous Men of Modern Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Your reader is Alec Datesman. Famous Men of Modern Times by John H. Horan and A. B. Poland Chapter 22 Charles the Twelfth of Sweden, 1682 to 1718 In the year 1697, 
A strange coronation service took place in the city of Stockholm. A boy of only fifteen years of age was crowned King of Sweden, and took the title of Charles the Twelfth. He was born in 1682. When he was only three or four years old, the Queen went into the nursery to take him to church, but he refused to get down from the high chair in which he was perched, because he had promised his nurse that he would not leave his seat until she had given him permission. He was taught German as well as Swedish as soon as he could speak, and history, geography, and arithmetic seemed like play to him. When only four years old, he was put astride a horse, and at eight he was a good rider. At eleven he killed his first bear, and before he was twelve he shot a stag at a distance of ninety yards. As soon as he began to wear the crown he became very pompous and arrogant. No one was allowed to find fault with anything that he did. About a year after Charles was made king, two princesses were brought to Stockholm to spend the winter in the hope that he would marry one of them. But Charles did not marry either of them. In fact, he was never really in love with anybody or with anything but war. One day, when he was out on a bear hunt, news was brought to him that the kings of Denmark and Poland and Peter the Great of Russia had formed a combination against him and proposed to capture Sweden and divide it amongst themselves. He gathered an army, placed himself at its head, sailed for Denmark, and soon forced the Danes to sue for peace. He then marched against the Russians. The Russians were five times as many as the Swedes, but Charles said, With my brave boys in blue behind me, I am afraid of nothing. On the march four hundred Swedes had been attacked by six thousand Russians, but the Swedes had beaten them off. Peter the Great and his men ran away as soon as the Swedes approached. But Charles followed them, and a great battle was fought in a driving snowstorm. Charles lost one of his boots in a bog, and a bullet was flattened against his clothing. But by nightfall the Swedes had won a complete victory. Charles was then only eighteen years of age. The next summer the young warrior marched against the united armies of Russia and Poland. After a fight which lasted all day, Charles was again victorious. Among the ladies of Poland was the beautiful Marie Aurora, she wrote a letter to Charles asking that she might see him in the hope of ending the war, but Charles made no reply. Then Aurora traveled to the Swedish camp, although it was in the depth of winter, but the king refused to see her. The lady, however, was not discouraged. One day she saw him riding toward her, and at once got out of her carriage and knelt before him in the muddy road. Charles raised his hat and made a low bow, but without stopping, he put spurs to his horse and went off at a gallop. In about three weeks both the capitals of Poland, Warsaw, and Krakow were in his hands. Charles at once found work for his army elsewhere. Saxony, which then belonged to his great enemy Augustus, was invaded and captured, and Charles remained in possession of it for more than a year. While Charles was busy with Saxony, Peter the Great attacked his provinces on the Baltic. He took possession of the principal ports and found on Swedish territory his new capital, St. Petersburg. In the defense of his territories, Charles engaged in several fierce battles with the Russians, and finally defeated them. The Russians retreated, and burned all the bridges behind them. He next determined to go to the succor of the Cossacks of the Ukraine. It was December. The cold was so intense that the Baltic Sea was frozen over, and many of the birds fell dead from the trees. The Swedes were poorly clothed and they suffered greatly from the cold. Over three thousand were frozen to death, and many others were frostbitten. Charles had lost twenty thousand out of an army of forty-one thousand, yet he would not give up the struggle, but determined to lay siege to the fortress of Poltava. Up to this time Charles had seemed to bear a charmed life, but one day a bullet struck his foot, some of the small bones were broken, and the flesh had to be cut open to remove the splinters. Charles watched the operation without flinching, but the wound gave him trouble, and he had to be carried about in a litter, as we have read in the story of Peter the Great. The boys in blue did wonders, but the struggle was really hopeless. They were utterly defeated, and Charles barely escaped with his life. He at length crossed the river Dnieper with the remnant of his army and took refuge with the Turks, and in the Turkish town of Bender, seven hundred miles from Sweden, he lived for several years. The Sultan of Turkey treated him kindly, and in Bender, Charles built for himself a stone house with walls like those of a fort. The Sultan also gave him a bodyguard of Janissaries. These men became very fond of him, and when they found what a strong will he had, they called him Ironhead. Some of them said, 
If Allah, God, would only give us such a ruler, we could conquer the world. Peter the Great had seized certain Turkish ports on the Black Sea, as well as the Swedish ports of the Baltic. So Charles proposed to the Sultan that the Turks and Swedes should unite their forces against Russia. To this the Sultan agreed, and, in 1710, war was declared and an army of 200,000 men marched against the Russians. Peter had only about 40,000, and he was very anxious for peace. He sent a wagon load of money to the Turkish commander and persuaded him to sign a treaty. Charles was not with the Turkish army when this was done, but he arrived immediately afterwards. He was terribly disappointed, and more so when the Sultan wrote him a letter advising him to return to Sweden. Charles refused to go. This made the Sultan angry, and he sent orders to seize Charles and take him, alive or dead, away from Bender. Charles sent word back that if they attempted to do this he would fight, and so an attack was made upon him in the house which he had built as a defense. Some of the Turkish soldiers refused to fight against him, and thirty of them were drowned in the river Dnieper by the Sultan's orders. Fifty of the soldiers who were friendly to him tried to persuade Charles to put himself into their hands, and when they failed they said, O Ironhead, Allah has made thee mad. Twelve thousand Turks then attacked Charles in his quarters. He fought bravely for his life, but was finally captured and turned over to the Turkish commander. He looked very unlike a king. His clothes were torn to rags, and his face was so blackened with powder and smeared with blood that he could scarcely be recognized. When the people in Sweden heard of his capture, some were greatly delighted at the king's bravery, but the wisest men in the kingdom felt aggrieved, and, all over Europe, it was said that Charles had gone mad. Some of the people in Sweden now said that unless Charles returned to Sweden, they must have another ruler, and a letter was sent to him imploring him to come home. This caused him at last to leave Turkey, and at midnight of November 11, 1714, he entered the fortified town of Straussund, which belonged to Sweden. His people were overjoyed at his return, but were disappointed that he did not cross the Baltic and come into Sweden itself. The neighboring powers were glad to have him stay in Straussund. Six of them, Russia, Prussia, Poland, Saxony, Denmark, and Hanover, had declared war against Sweden, and they thought they could capture King Charles quite easily while he was in Straussund. They besieged the town, but Charles defended it bravely. To encourage his men, he went to the most dangerous places, he even took his meals within range of the enemy's guns. He slept on the ground with a stone for his pillow, and shared all the hardships of the siege equally with the common soldiers. But, in spite of all his bravery, Charles saw that Stralsund must surrender. He therefore crossed the Baltic in a boat and made his home in the city of Lund, in Sweden. Poor Sweden was almost ruined, and its future looked very dark indeed. It seemed as though Charles could not see in what a wretched state his kingdom was. Everyone else knew that Sweden must have peace, for she had lost in battle or by disease almost one-fourth of all her men. Most of the fisheries were abandoned, because the fishermen had been taken to man the fleet. A large part of the farms were cultivated by women and boys. There was a great scarcity of meat, butter, and tallow, and as tallow was used for making candles, the people were unable to work in the mornings or evenings because no candles could be bought. The king shared the poverty of his people. There was no silver on his table. All his dishes were of pewter. He slept on a straw mattress with his cloak spread over him. His passion for war was as strong as ever, and finally he determined to invade Norway, which then belonged to Denmark. He attacked the Norwegian fortress called Frederiksten. Trenches were dug within gunshot of the fortress. One morning, as he was looking over the top of one of the trenches, he was struck by a bullet and instantly killed. Charles was a brave man, but he was not a good ruler. He had a great fondness for fighting, and a strange power of making others fond of it. His people loved him, and they continued to honor him. He brought his country to the verge of ruin. More than 150,000 men perished in his wars, and he left Sweden poorer both in territory and in wealth than it was when his reign began. End of chapter 22. Read by Alec Datesman, Brooklyn, New York. Twenty-three of Famous Men of Modern Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Jevons Famous Men of Modern Times by John H. Haran and A. B. Poland Chapter 23 Frederick the Great, 1712-1786 to In the year 1730, all Europe was startled with strange news. Tidings went from kingdom to kingdom that the crown prince of Prussia had been condemned to death by a court-martial on a charge brought by his father the king. When the news reached Vienna, the emperor of Austria sent word to the Prussian king begging him not to allow his son to be executed, and the kings of Poland and Sweden made the same request. The young man was charged with being a deserter from the Prussian army. He belonged to a famous regiment called the Potsdam Guard, of which his father was very proud. His father was a hard, harsh man. The one thing that he loved to do was to save money. The one thing that he disliked to do was to spend it. Frederick had been made to study hard when he was only seven years old. His father's rule was that he should get up at six in the morning, not staying in bed one minute after he was called. On Saturday morning he was examined on the lessons learned during the week, and if he passed a good examination, the afternoon was given him as a half-holiday. If the examination was not good, he had to stay in and study. Then, besides studying, he was obliged, before he was twelve years old, to drill as a soldier. But young Frederick was not so fond of playing soldier as most boys are. You will not be surprised to hear that the Crown Prince was not very fond of his father, and the King seems to have really hated the Prince. Once it is said that he tried to strangle him to death with the cord of a curtain. The prince at length made up his mind that he would run away from his father's palace and go to stay with his uncle, George the Second, who was King of England. But his father discovered his plan and thwarted it. Then came the court-martial. The prince was found guilty of deserting his regiment and was sentenced to death. He would have been executed had not the Emperor of Austria and the kings of Poland and Sweden said so much against it. A few days later the prince signed a promise to submit to his father. He was then released from prison and watched very carefully. As he now behaved himself to suit the crusty old king, he was made colonel of the Potsdam Guard. Not long after this his father had a serious sickness, and was never quite strong again as long as he lived. He became softened and affectionate towards his son, and before his death he saw what a mistake he had made in thinking so little of him. Frederick the Second began his reign on May the thirty first, seventeen forty. The next day he made this promise to the people Our great care shall be to make every one of our subjects contented and happy. He began well. Some time before his father's death, the crops in Prussia had failed and a famine prevailed, but the miserly old king was afraid of being cheated and would not sell to the people the wheat which belonged to the crown. Frederick the Second at once sold the grain to all who needed it, and ordered that a thousand poor women should be comfortably fed and clothed at his own expense. He altered his manner of living. He made a great change in the army, enlarged it to the number of one hundred thousand, and very early in his reign he went to war. His reason for fighting was this. About a hundred years before he was born, one of his ancestors made an agreement with the Duke of a province called Silesia, that if either of them should die without an heir, his territory should go to the other. This agreement was duly written on parchment and signed and sealed. The Duke of Silesia died, leaving no heir. So by the agreement Silesia ought to have become part of Prussia. However, the Archduke of Austria took possession of it. It had been a part of Austria so long that most people seemed to have forgotten that Prussia had a claim to it. Frederick the Second did not forget and soon after he came to the throne he wrote to Maria Theresa, the Archduchess of Austria, and made the claim that Silesia was part of his dominions. He offered to pay a large sum of money for the province, though he said it was his, but Maria refused to give it or sell it. Frederick, without loss of time, marched with a large army into the country. Breslau, the capital of Silesia, opened its gates to him without resistance, and most of the other towns followed its example. Maria Theresa sent a large army into the field, and Frederick's first battle was fought. It took place near a town called Molwitz. 
This battle is famous not because of the number of men who were killed and wounded, but because King Frederick himself fled from the field. After his flight the tide turned, and his troops gained the victory. Maria Theresa was greatly alarmed, but she did a very wise thing. She was Queen of Hungary, as well as Archduchess of Austria. She knew that the Hungarians were great fighters, so she invited the nobles of Hungary to meet her, and said to them, "'You are my only allies, and I throw myself on your generosity.' These words went to their hearts, and they voted that all Hungary should arm and fight for her. But her troops were again badly defeated, and she was forced to surrender nearly all of Silesia to Frederick. In twenty months Frederick thus won for Prussia a territory larger than Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island put together. And really it was a fortunate thing for the Silesians that they became Prussians. The province was soon far more productive and prosperous than it had ever been, and the people were a great deal happier. When peace came, Frederick was as busy at home as on the field of battle. To do what he thought a king ought to do, he found that his day must contain a great many hours, so he gave orders that a servant should awaken him at four o'clock. On several mornings he dropped asleep again after being called, so he ordered the servant to mop his face at four o'clock with a cold wet towel. This made him wide awake, and through his life four was his hour for rising. He went to bed about nine or ten, so he hardly ever had more than six hours sleep. Maria Theresa kept him busy, for she did not rest content with the loss of Silesia. Frederick had reason to suppose that she was going to try to regain the lost province, so he immediately invaded her territories. He gained four victories, and thus secured Silesia a second time. After Frederick had conquered her in the Second Silesian War, she found Russia, France, Sweden and Saxony ready to fight against him. Maria Theresa and her new friends agreed that they would destroy Frederick's army, get possession of Prussia, and divide it amongst themselves. But Frederick took his enemies by surprise. On August the 24th, 1756, he invaded Saxony, and thus began what is known as the Seven Years' War. At the very beginning he was successful, and forced the whole Saxon army to surrender. After this, however, his good fortune left him. The Austrians gained a great victory over him at a place called Kolen, and in about three years from the beginning of the war the Allies had really almost ruined him. Another great battle was fought with the Austrians and Prussians at a place called Kunersdorf. When Frederick saw that this battle also was likely to be lost, he led the attack three times himself. Three horses were killed under him. A bullet struck a small metal box in his vest pocket and was flattened. Had it not been for the box, he must have been killed. All his efforts, however, were in vain. The defeat was terrible, and Frederick was in despair. He wrote to a friend, "'All is lost. I will not survive the ruin of the fatherland. Adieu for ever.' It is said at this time he kept in his pocket some little pills of poison ready to take, if all seemed hopeless. Then a piece of good luck happened. The Russians expected the Austrians to feed their army because it was fighting for them, but instead of sending flour the Austrians sent money. The Russian general said that his men could not eat silver, and as winter was approaching he marched home to Russia. The campaign of the year now closing, 1759, the year so famous in America for the conquest of Canada by the English, had been most unfortunate for Frederick. He had lost six thousand men, and Prussia was nearly exhausted both of men and of money. But the king was wonderfully brave, and he inspired all Prussia with courage and hope. Besides, he gained some victories. One night, when he was sitting half asleep by one of his watchfires, a horseman galloped into camp, exclaiming, "'Where is the king?' "'Here,' answered Frederick. The rider hurriedly said, "'The enemy has driven in our outposts "'and is not five hundred yards from our left wing.' Instantly Frederick gave his orders, and in a few minutes ten cannons were pouring shot into the ranks of the enemy. The attack of the Austrians was terrible, but the Prussians stood their ground heroically, and the Austrians were driven back. They lost ten thousand men, the Prussians only eighteen hundred. The tide had turned, and another great battle gained at Torgau, 
left Frederick a third time master of Silesia. When a treaty was made, Maria Theresa was obliged to give up the province forever. Prussia, at the beginning of Frederick's reign, had been small and insignificant. At the end of the Seven Years' War she was one of the great powers of Europe. Frederick was as great in peace as in war. He lent money to those in need. He furnished seed to the farmers. He called himself the chief servant of the state, and really worked like a slave for the good of his people. It is said that in seven years the country was as prosperous as ever. One of the most remarkable and one of the saddest things ever done in Europe was what is called the Partition of Poland. Russia, Austria and Prussia decided to cut up the little kingdom and divide it among themselves. Yet Prussia's share of Poland was much benefited by being brought under the government of Frederick. When he took charge of it, the people were in a wretched condition. Frederick soon changed all this, and the country became prosperous and its inhabitants comfortable. To the last, he was a rigid disciplinarian. He was as severe upon himself as upon others. In August 1786, he ordered the army to go through a number of sham fights. While witnessing one of these, he caught a chill, which brought on an illness from which he never recovered. At about twelve o'clock, on the night of his death, one of his dogs which was sitting near him was shivering with cold, and Frederick said, Throw a quilt over him. These were the last words which he spoke, and at half-past two he was dead. End of chapter 23「Chapter twenty four of Famous Men of Modern Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Your reader is Alec Datesman. Famous Men of Modern Times by John H. Harron and A. B. Poland. Chapter twenty four. William Pitt, seventeen o eight. To 1778. While Frederick the Great was making Prussia a prominent European power, the elder William Pitt, first Earl of Chatham, was making England great. He held the office of Prime Minister only once, and that for not more than two years. But his wisdom and uprightness gave him such influence that he was the real ruler of the country for many years. He was born in 1708 in the southwestern part of England his father being a country gentleman of prominent family and considerable wealth. The childhood of the future statesman was passed amid rural scenes and pleasures. As a boy he was remarkably fond of books, and by his careful attention to study he gratified both his parents and his teachers. He was also a lover of sports and games. This, however, did not prevent his suffering, even during his school days, from attack of gout, a disease which he inherited. When he entered Trinity College, Oxford, few students of his age were so well read, but owing to his lack of robust health he was obliged to leave the university without taking his degree. Going to the continent, he spent two years in travel and study in France and Italy. He then returned to England, and secured an officer's commission in a regiment of dragoons. He soon discovered that he had made a mistake in choosing the army as a profession. He saw that his best work could be done in public life. The young officer immediately began to take steps to secure a public position. Fortunately, the right of representing the borough of Old Sarum belonged to his family, and thus he was enabled to become a member of Parliament. His speeches in the House of Commons were forcible and at times very eloquent. One day he spoke against a measure proposed by Horace Walpole, then Prime Minister of England. Walpole was so offended at the strong language of Pitt that he had the latter dismissed from the army, with which he had not as yet severed his connection. "'Now I shall turn my energies wholly to politics,' Pitt said to his friends. "'I am really glad Walpole has prevented my remaining in the army. I am not in any way fitted to be a soldier.'" From the time that Pitt entered Parliament to the last day of his life, he was devoted to public affairs. He quickly showed that he had great genius for political management. There was no orator in the House of Commons whose speeches commanded so much attention, but the source of his power was no mystery. 
It was the simple fact that he invariably advocated measures which he believed to be for the benefit of the people. After some experience in political life, he was chosen a member of the cabinet, and though he was not nominally prime minister, he was really at the head of the government. Nearly all its important measures were suggested by him. He ventured on one occasion to oppose the wishes of King George the Second, and consequently was obliged to resign his position but the king found it impossible to carry on the government without him. The people demanded that he should return to office, and within a few months he was recalled. The condition of England at this time was one of feebleness. Pitt put the army and navy into such a condition that during the famous Seven Years' War, in which England, as the ally of Frederick the Great, was at war with France, the latter country was forced to cede to England most valuable possessions both in America and India. Pitt inspired England with national enthusiasm. It was during the years 1756 to 1761 that he had the fullest opportunity to show his surpassing qualities. His wise choice of men like Wolfe in Canada and Clive in India, and his vigorous measures in the management of foreign affairs, made England respected in every part of the world. The people called him the Great Commoner, because up to this time he was without a title of nobility. Never before had so great a leader of public affairs appeared in England. The young king was obstinate. He was determined to be a real king, as he said. So one day, when Pitt advised that war should be declared against Spain, which had made an alliance with France, the great enemy of England, the king and his council refused to agree to such a war. Pitt then decided to give up his office and have nothing further to do with the management of the government. The king received his resignation calmly and made no request to Pitt to remain in office. Nevertheless, he granted him a pension of $15,000 a year. After his retirement from office, Pitt remained in the House of Commons, and was, as he had so long been, its foremost member. His eloquent voice was constantly heard in the debates, and his word had influence not only with Parliament, but with the whole nation. Twice he was urged to take part in the government, but refused. At last, in 1766, King George invited him to choose a ministry to suit himself, and Pitt accepted the invitation. In the new ministry, he selected for himself the office of Privy Seal, with a seat in the House of Lords as Viscount Pitt and Earl of Chatham. His acceptance of the title lost him at first considerable popularity, but his continued devotion to the people's interests, even as a member of the nobility, eventually restored public confidence. He ceased to be Prime Minister in 1768, and was succeeded in that office by Lord North. Like Burke, he denounced in the most fearless manner the arbitrary and unjust measures of the government of Lord North toward the American colonies. He insisted that the colonists were entitled to all the rights of British subjects, and urged in the warmest way that the difficulties between them and the government should be amicably settled. The name of Pittsburgh, in Pennsylvania, was given by his American admirers to commemorate his efforts on behalf of the rights of his colonial fellow citizens. When he died, in May 1778, the entire English nation, in the colonies as well as at home, mourned with genuine grief. He had been a patriot and a statesman, not a mere politician. End of chapter 24 Read by Alec Datesman, Brooklyn, New York